got another question for the A-level chemistry multiple choice practice. So this is the fifth one now for inorganic and physical chemistry. There's a separate playlist for organic if you want to have a look at that. I hope you like the video. If you haven't already subscribed, why don't you consider subscribing to the channel? And as always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you want to try them first. Okay, so make a start. So question one is just a test of your memory, basically. So what's the definition for um, electronegativity? And it's option C, the attraction of a bonded atom for the electrons in a covalent bond. Moving on to number two. So a chlorate, that Roman numeral there is seven. So a chlorate seven ion has a one minus charge. So chlorate will contain chlorine and oxygen. So that's what we know so far. And we've got to come up with a formula for sodium chlorate seven. So remember sodium's a one plus ion. So basically how many O's at minus two each in terms of oxidation number do we need to leave a one minus charge when it's together with a plus seven chlorine? And the answer is four. So the formula of sodium chlorate seven is going to be NaClO4. So that's option B. So for number three, the first thing we need to do is work out the oxidation number changes for it's the silver and the nitrogen in this case. So you can see in red, I've got the oxidation numbers of those atoms above the atom and the change for silver is one, zero to plus one, nitrogen is three plus five down to plus two. So the rule is we need to have the overall changes being the same. So that means we need threes in front of the silver species. So the next thing we need to do is make sure the charges match on each side of the equation. So I'm just gonna ignore the H plus for the moment because I'm gonna balance this uh, in this step. So at the moment, without that H plus, we've got one minus charge on the left We've got three plus on the right. So we need to bring that one minus up to three plus. So we need a four in front of the H plus ions. And the last thing we need to do is balance the rest of the equation using those water molecules. And so you can see we've got four H's now on the left. So we need two on the right. So now you can see in the equation, the ratio of silver to H2O is three to two. So well done if you got that one right. I think that's a bit tricky, that one. Moving on to number four. So to get the number of things, so molecules in this case, we work out the moles and multiply by Avogadro's number. So first thing I need to do is work out how many moles of these we've got. So that was just mass over MR each time. And you can see B has the largest number of moles. So it will have the largest number of molecules. Moving on to number five, so the first thing we need to do is write the equation for the reaction between chromium-3 oxide and magnesium. Next thing I'm going to do is work out how many moles of chromium-3 oxide that is, that 11.4 grams. So that's just mass over MR, so 0 0.075 moles of the chromium-3 oxide. So we're going to use the ratio now, so multiply by 3 to get the moles of magnesium. So that's 0.225, and then all we're going to do now is multiply by the MR of magnesium, which is 24.3, and we get 5.47 grams, so it was D. Moving on to number six, so the first thing we've got to appreciate is that if we've got 0.4 moles per decimeter cubed magnesium iodide, the concentration of iodide ions in here is going to be double that because it's MgI2. So now we've established that, we need to look at the factor sort of decrease in the concentration going from 0 0.8 moles per decimeter cubed to 0 0.25 moles per decimeter cubed. So this new solution is 3.2 times less concentrated than the original. So basically we need to dilute it so the volume is 3.2 times bigger. So if we've got 100 cm cubed here, this volume needs to be 3.2 times that, so it needs to be 320. But we've got to be careful. We're not going to add 320 cm cubed because then the total volume would be um, 420. We need to add 
220 and that will get us up to the 320 so it was option C moving on to number seven so I've just got a very crude outline of the periodic table there just to remind you of the general trends in first ionization energy so down any group first ionization energy decreases and going across any period in general first ionization energy increases as you can see I've also mapped out where these elements are so the lowest first ionization energy is going to be calcium and the highest will be nitrogen so we're looking for where they are sort of in these um, trends and you can see straight away in option A calcium's the lowest nitrogen's the highest so it was option A moving on to number 8 so delta H for a reaction using bond enthalpies I call it in minus out so it's the sum of the energy that has to go in to break the bonds in the reactants so these things here uh, and then you subtract from that the energy released when the bonds form in the product so that's my out energy so there's all the numbers there and when you put that in your calculator you get minus 11 or 2 so it was b Moving on to number nine, so I think this is a little bit tricky to get your head around here, so hopefully this will make sense. So we want to know which container will have the highest equilibrium concentration of carbon monoxide. So basically, we're looking for equilibria that are going to go left, backwards. So I'm ruling out A and C straight away because I've got no um, carbon dioxide or nitrogen monoxide. So this equilibrium is going to go forwards and C we don't have any nitrogen monoxide. So this one will also go forwards. So we're left with B and D. So if we focus on the carbon monoxide, you've already got in B some carbon monoxide. You haven't got any in D. So when this goes backwards, that one mole will increase. So B was the answer. Moving on to number 10, so pH of a weak acid calculation. So the H plus concentration for a weak monobasic acid is calculated using the square root of the Ka multiplied by the original acid concentration. I call this the square root of Kaha equation. So you'll notice they haven't given us the Ka, they've given us the pKa. So the Ka for the acid is 10 to the minus pKa, multiplying that by the concentration of the acid. So that's coming out at 2.95 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per decimeter cubed. So we minus log that and you get 2.53. So A is the answer. Moving on to number 11. I think this, for me anyway, this was the worst one of the lot. Um, it really messed with my head, this one. But anyway, let's see if this explanation makes sense. So this um, reaction, we want it to be feasible at high temperatures. So delta G needs to be negative when temperature is high. Um, but not feasible at low temperatures. So delta G needs to be positive when T is low. And obviously delta G is calculated from the Gibbs equation, delta H minus T delta S. So the way I worked it out was I just put the signs in above the terms in the Gibbs equation. So this is these are the signs for A. And remember temperature is always positive in the Kelvin scale. So I've put a loop round here because this whole term because we've got a minus times a plus is going to stay negative. So we're combining a positive term with a negative term. So if you think about it, as T increases in this term, it's going to make the overall delta G negative, so feasible at high temperature. But when T is low, this is a low negative number, and so the chances are delta H could outweigh and therefore make delta G positive. So that actually is the answer. So that was nice of the exam board. Moving on to 12, so obviously we've got another definition for oxidizing agent. They are electron acceptors. So we're interested only in the species on the left hand side of these two systems because they are the electron acceptors. So that means straight away I can rule out iron and copper because they're electron donors, they're reducing agents. So the strongest oxidizing agent is the one that can go forwards the most readily and it's this copper 2 plus system because it's got the more positive electrode potential. So C was the answer. 
Moving on to number 13, so this little diagram here is representing um, a diatomic halogen molecule. So when we boil this thing, we need to break these intermolecular forces between the molecules. What we're not doing is breaking this covalent bond. So we'll run through the options, see which statements are correct. So the induced dipole, dipole interactions, London forces get stronger. Yeah, that's right, because as you go down the halogens, they get more electrons and that makes these intermolecular forces stronger. Number two, absolutely nothing to do with the strength of the covalent bond, so that's wrong. The permanent dipole, dipole interactions get stronger, that's wrong as well, because these are non-polar molecules. So only one was right, D. Moving on to number 14, so given the nature of these statements, the easiest thing to do is knock up a little dot and cross diagram for this molecule. So is it polar? Yep because the terminal atoms are different. We've also got a lone pair around the central atom as well. So it's definitely polar. It's got six lone pairs of electrons. Well, let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. And it has a bond angle of 180 degrees. Well, it definitely looks linear the way I've drawn it, but because of that lone pair, we've got this extra repulsion from the lone pair. It's actually gonna push these uh, bonds down. So it's actually a non-linear molecule, so that one was wrong. One and two correct, B is the answer. Moving on to number 15, so the sort of trick here is to get the charge of the iron um, correct. So we know that it's got one ammonium ion, so NH4 one plus. We know it's got two sulfate ions, so they're two minus each. So to keep the whole thing neutral, it's got an overall charge, the iron needs to be three plus. So we'll run through the tests and the results, see which ones are correct. So when you react it with sodium hydroxide, would you get a green precipitate? No, you wouldn't because it's iron three plus, not iron two plus. If you react it with barium nitrate, would you get a white precipitate? Yeah, you would because they would, the barium ions would react with the sulfate ions and give barium sulfate precipitate, which is white. And three, reaction with warm sodium hydroxide, would you get a red-brown precipitate? Yeah, you would, because it's iron three plus. Would you get an alkaline gas? Yeah, you would, because ammonium ions do give ammonia when they're reacted with warm sodium hydroxide. So two and three, right, C.